Hi everyone. So today we're going to be talking about avoiding extremes and what does it mean to land in the middle way or on the middle way to see things as they are free from annihilation or nihilism and free from permanence or eternalism. So these two extremes are what the mind does when thinking about the self. And we can go off the deep end in two different ways. We can think that if everything is empty of inherent existence, that must mean that nothing exists, that nothing matters, that ethics are arbitrary and that there's no point to life and you slide into a depressed apathy. The other way of responding to that misunderstanding, to that extreme of annihilation, is to become very hedonistic and to put too much focus on pleasure seeking and the present moment in a narrow way, in yourself in a narrow way, because nothing really matters anyway. So that's an extreme. And it's the result of wrong thinking. The extreme of permanence or annihilation is maybe more likely for us to think that there is some kind of core, innate, instinctual, hard soul, Atman, unchanging aspect that we gather experiences to or extract experiences from or that we, you know, evolve in some way, but we're adding to a core that is always the same. And we have the impression of the self being something that is very findable and something that is very unique because of making itself that way, as opposed to unique because of what it has come into contact with. And so there's a lot of ramifications in terms of problematic behavior, in terms of suffering, when we fall into either of these extreme views. But now we'll look at the way the different tenant schools look at them. So I'll put a chart up and we can have a look. Here we go. So all of the tenant schools seek the middle way. They all seek the middle way by avoiding the two extremes, the extreme of annihilation or nihilism, nihilism, and avoiding the extreme of permanence, sometimes referred to as eternalism. So starting at the bottom with the Great Exposition School, the Vibashikas, they avoid the extreme of annihilation by thinking about the fact that all phenomena are substantially established. And they avoid the extreme of permanence by considering that all conditioned phenomena are impermanent. So they avoid falling into the trap of believing in nothingness or emptiness as a complete absence of anything whatsoever. They don't go off the deep end by thinking that things are substantially established, even though they don't believe that they are independent, that they are unitary, or that they are partless. They, th they land on an idea of yet they still substantially exist in some way from their own side. So that there is an idea that there is projection from our side, but there is still something there from the side of the object or the person, etc. And that's how they land on not falling into the extreme of annihilation. They avoid the extreme of permanence by thinking all conditioned phenomena are impermanent, so conditioned phenomena means produced by causes and conditions. So they don't believe that things have this kind of eternal forever quality in an unchanging way because anything that is produced is conditioned. The Sutra school or the Sotrantika avoids the extreme of annihilation by considering that objects are natural bases for names and conception. So again, they don't believe in permanent, unitary, partless self or objects, but they do believe that objects are natural bases for names and conceptions. So again, that there is something from the side of the basis, but not independently. 
So those two views are quite similar. It's a very subtle distinction. They avoid the extreme of permanence by considering that permanent phenomena are not substantially existent. Avoid the extreme of this eternalistic idea by thinking about the fact that they don't exist substantially as a substance that is self-creating or spontaneously there, causelessly. The mind-only school, the Chittimatra, avoid the extreme of annihilation by thinking that other powered and thoroughly established phenomena are truly existent. So other powered and thoroughly established are specific terminology that the mind-only school particularly uses, and we're not going to go into all of those details um, for this presentation. But to think that things in general, for them, have some sort of true existence. And they avoid the other extreme by thinking that objects are not natural bases for names and conceptions. They believe everything comes from the mind only, hence the name. The autonomy school, the middle way autonomy school, the Sva Tantrika, believe that all phenomena do exist from their own side and that no phenomena is truly existent. So this is a very interesting, very subtle point. To think that all phenomena exist from their own side is a little bit like the idea that there is an illusion present, but there still is something to put the illusion on. So there's like 10% from the side of the basis and 90% from the side of the person. To say no phenomena is truly existent for them is not quite as subtle as the view of the middle way consequence school, but pretty close. And then the highest school, the most subtle school, the Madhyamaka Prasangika, the middle way consequence school, they avoid the extreme of annihilation by thinking the very most subtle form of dependent arising, which is that all phenomena are merely imputed by conception meaning merely labeled by the mind. And they avoid the extreme of permanence by thinking about the fact that no phenomena exists from its own side. Things have an existence, but not from their own side. They didn't make themselves. So that's a very brief overview of the way that the schools avoid the two extremes. Some of that is easy to get lost in terminology don't squeeze your head too much about it. Don't worry too much about those details. But just notice that there's a little bit of variation in how they stay out of the two traps. But the intention of all of them is to land in the middle way. Okay, so now we'll shift gears and have a little bit of a look at a praise of dependent arising. So I'll put it up on the screen, but if you'd prefer to look at the hard copy or at the PDF on your tablet, please do so. We're looking at pages 18 to 21 in the hard copy and pages 7 to 9 in the PDF. And I'll put it on the screen. Here we go. So from the Mahayana Buddhist point of view, no matter how microscopically you delve into the level of subatomic particles, you can never find a particle so small that it cannot be divided into parts. No partless particle can ever be found to exist. Some non-Buddhists believe that you can actually find a final particle that is partless. They posit that it is the collection of these foundational partless particles that act as a basis upon which phenomena come together in a permanent way. They say permanent because these first foundational particles can be found. The Mahayana Buddhist view, however, is that no matter how small the particle you discover, you can never find one to be partless, as they do not exist. Two different non-Buddhist schools on this topic can be explored here. One asserts that the partless particle to be the first cause. This view holds that it is possible to trace everything back 
to a first partless particle. And from this first partless particle, all other phenomena have come into existence. The other non-Buddhist view here posits some sort of creator as the first cause. This view traces all phenomena back to a first permanent cause that is a creator god, like Ishvara, who then creates everything else. Buddhists hold that there is no permanent cause, because a permanent thing could not have the ability to create or produce anything. The assertion of a first permanent cause contains numerous faults and many questions arise. For example, for a first result to be produced by a cause, that cause must change to become non-existent or be destroyed before the result can come about. If that first cause were permanent, then how could a result come about? How is that result empowered? The other obvious question that arises is, from where did this first cause come? How did it arise? A further fault is that if a result were to come about from a permanent first cause, then that result itself would not be able to change and would exist forever. Furthermore, any result could arise from that cause. There would be no relationship between cause and result, because the cause would always exist. For example, if it were possible for an apple to come about from a permanent seed, then you could also posit that a mango could arise from that permanent apple seed, because there would be no direct relationship between the cause and the effect. Thus, any cause could give rise to any effect. Why? This is because the effect too would be permanent. The result would have to come about completely independent of causes and conditions coming together. Since if the cause were permanent, the result would also have to be permanent. So if there were no reliance on a specific causes and conditions coming together, then any result could come about from any cause. There would be randomness. It is clear that if you posit a permanent first cause, then many problems and questions arise that remain unanswered. The third understanding of dependent within dependent arising is the idea of dependence upon the process of being merely labeled by the mind. There is a basis upon which one labels, and a mind which labels onto that basis, and independence upon these two the labeled phenomena comes into existence. It is in this way that phenomena are dependent on merely being labeled by the mind. This final understanding of dependence is completely unique to the highest Buddhist philosophical school, the consequentialist school of the Middle Way, or Prasangika Madhyamaka. Question. If everything is dependent, how do permanent phenomena exist? We are able to say that permanent phenomena exist if we apply all three of these understandings of dependent arising. The first understanding, that things come about in dependence on causes and conditions, does not apply to permanent phenomena, since they do not come about through causes and conditions. Understanding that phenomena also come about through reliance on their parts and the collection of their parts, one can see that permanent phenomena exist dependently in that way. Further, permanent phenomena are dependent arisings in that they come about through being merely labeled by the mind, in dependence on the basis to be labeled, and the mind that labels it. The middle way consequentialists say that all phenomena, both impermanent and permanent, exist in that final way of being merely labeled by the mind, and are dependent arisings for that reason. For that reason, too, they are empty of existing from their own side and do not exist ultimately. It is important to know these three different understandings of dependent arising. To summarize, 
The first understanding is coming together, or meeting, which refers to results arising through coming together of causes and conditions. This is the understanding that things are dependent arisings because they arise in dependence upon causes and conditions. The second understanding is that things are dependent arisings because they are reliant on their parts and the coming together of those parts. The third understanding is that phenomena are dependent in that they are merely labeled by the mind. Things are dependent on both a mind that labels and on a basis of designation. With all three understandings, we have the consequentialist understanding of what a dependent arising is. Remember that the lower Buddhist schools, the particularists and the followers of Sutra, only posit dependent arising on the level of the first understanding, dependence on causes and conditions. They would say that permanent phenomena exist, but not as dependent arisings, because they do not come about through causes and conditions from their perspective. Okay, so there's some things to explore about permanence and about partless particles, and, you know, it's just kind of a an aside, and it's mostly the lowest school, the Great Exposition School, where this conversation comes into play, and also conversations with non-Buddhists. For us, what's interesting to consider is what is the implication of believing in a creator, a creator god that is sentient, or a creating particle fundamental building block for life, for matter, for consciousness and existence that is partless. So what's the ramifications of that worldview? And you can start to think about things like, for example, if there is a creator god, the problem from a Buddhist perspective is not the teachings of such a god or the disciple or the manifestation of such a god on earth, explaining things about ethics, about loving kindness, all of that were very, yay, that's fantastic. The idea that there is a divine being with omniscience who is infinitely compassionate, we have no problem with that. What we have a problem with is the idea that there is a being who started everything, who made everything, and who is somehow manufacturing a plan. Because then the question becomes how and why. So it's not something that we want to argue with people of faith about. You know, people can believe what they want to believe, particularly if it leads them to lead happy lives, ethical lives, to find meaning and purpose. But the conversation becomes very interesting when there is tragedy. Because if it's God's plan, why? And maybe you think, oh, it's to teach us something about something. Okay, that works. Um, There was an interesting quote one of my relatives sent me once where um, we see a starving child and we scream at God about why, when really God is the screaming child telling us, look. You know, so we don't really know what's happening in terms of what this creator figure is trying to orchestrate for us in order for us to develop and evolve. Maybe the suffering we see around us isn't what we think it is. That's a possibility, right? So I don't want to completely discount people's beliefs of that type. But it is interesting to explore if there is creation, how did it just start out of nowhere? A magic spark that began it all. Does that make more sense? Or does it make more sense to think that because experientially we see that all results or effects have a cause in the natural world, why would that be something that just happened? So just kind of sit with this idea of what is the negative ramification of believing in a divine creator? What is the problematic kind of logic and science of thinking that there is maybe an essential building block that is a partless particle? And, you know, just kind of explore that. So I'll leave it there. And I think it's interesting for you to discuss now amongst yourselves for a few minutes about what is 
the positive side of having a religious worldview where you believe in a creator and what's the negative side. And, you know, you don't need to get into a theosophical debate about who's right and who's wrong, but just kind of more from a lawyer's perspective, take both sides and see what it does for your mind. And then shift to, what if there was no creator of this world? What if mind was the creator of this world? We were all co-creating our world and co-creating our reality all together. And the play of cause and effect flows from it. So go ahead and discuss for a little bit, and then we'll have the meditation. Now we're going to meditate on causation, whether there was some sort of permanent essential particle or creator that began everything, or whether causation makes more sense in terms of impermanent changing moment to moment phenomena. So here we go. Take a minute and settle your posture. And now setting a motivation, thinking to ourselves, we're meditating on causation, cause and effect, in order to deeply understand why we suffer, how it happens, why there's happiness, and if we can increase it. How does anything happen? Why are we here? And may all of these investigations, whether we land on a conclusion or not, help us gather momentum for the whole path to developing our potential, enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. Allow that motivation to settle and sink in. You can simplify it into your own words if you like. And before we begin analysis, allow the surface distractions to settle by briefly focusing on the breath.
Try not to anticipate the points to come or what's coming after the meditation. Try not to slide into reminiscing. Allow yourself to just be with bodhicitta mindfulness, keeping a gentle and attentive focus only on the breath, only on the breath. And now shift to analysis. Lama Zopa Rinpoche says, to remember how the self, action, object, friend, enemy, stranger, our body and our possessions are transitory in nature. They change within every second by causes and conditions, and because of that, they can stop at any time. Therefore, it's not worthwhile to get angry, have the dissatisfied mind of desire, or give rise to wrong conceptions, such as the concept of permanence. Believing these things, which are transitory in nature, to be something other than what they really are is the fundamental problem of life, the fundamental suffering in our life. Being mindful of the nature of the self, action, object, and these other things brings tranquility to our mind. It protects our mind. It protects us from disturbing thoughts, wrong conceptions, it protects us from all harmful thoughts and actions, or karma, which harm us and other sentient beings. When we live our life with the concept of permanence and other mistaken thoughts, we look at things in a way that is contradictory to reality, a way in which they don't exist. Living like this brings confusion and thousands of problems into our life. It's living in a state of confusion. Meditation on impermanence in everyday life, in other words, awareness of the reality of these things, is essential. It is the basis for happiness and peace of mind and the best protection for our life. And so just sit with Lama Zopa Rinpoche's words for a moment, thinking first at the level of impermanence, that all of these things that matter in our life, agent, action, object, friends, enemies, strangers, etc., these things that matter change moment to moment to moment. There are permanent things, but not those. The things we encounter on a daily basis, all of our hopes and fears are based on, all of our pain, all of our joy, all revolves around things that are changeable.
impermanence is talking about causation. It's talking about production, cessation, disintegration, coming together and falling apart. So just sit with the fact that impermanence is neither good news nor bad news. It's just what is. When we're under the influence of grasping at permanence, then when there is joy, we cling, we hunger for more, we become tight about, and there is a deep grief when it ends inevitably. When there is grief, pain, other types of suffering and agitation, when we're grasping at permanence, it feels like we'll feel this way forever. Even though it changes, it always has, it always will. So grasping at permanence is untrue and unuseful. It makes good things ruined. It makes bad things more painful. Reflect for a minute on the negative impact grasping at permanence has had on your life. And then continuing on with Lama Zopa Rinpoche's words, meditation on emptiness. Rinpoche says, in addition to meditating on impermanence, we also have to meditate on emptiness. Now when we say, I'm listening to Dharma, we're labeling what I'm doing in dependence upon our aggregates, the association of our body and mind are doing. By thinking of our aggregates and what they're doing, we label, I'm listening to Dharma. If our aggregates are sitting on a chair, we say, I'm sitting on a chair. When we think of the I, hear the word I, or talk about the I, we're putting the label I on our aggregates. When the I is doing the action of listening to teachings, since our mind is paying attention to the words, we impute, I'm listening to teachings. And it's same with the object, the teachings. The label teachings is imputed to the words that we hear, which were taught by the Buddha. When we think of our enemy, or say or hear the word enemy, Again, it is imputed. We've labeled some being enemy. When we think of our friend, we apply the label friend. We also apply the label stranger to the aggregates of someone we don't know. When we see our possessions, Again, we apply the label possessions in dependence upon that particular base. It's the same with our body. When we think of our body or hear the word body, again, it's the label that we've imputed to the base of a torso with limbs and a head. In dependence upon that base, we label body. From morning to night, no matter what we think, talk, or hear about, we're thinking, talking, or hearing about labels. We're labeling things every time we think. Every time we have a conversation at work or at home, 
we're constantly applying labels. We're making things exist by applying labels. Whenever we're thinking of anything, we're thinking about the labels, which are imputed. Take, for example, the object that we label clock. Each part of the clock has a label. Each label is applied to another label, which is applied to another label, which is applied to another label, and so on, down to the atoms. Even atom is a label that is merely imputed to another label. Atoms have particles, as was mentioned in the Prasangika Madhyamaka, one of the four Buddhist schools of philosophy, and discovered more recently by modern science. One label is placed upon another label, which is placed upon another label, and so on down to the atoms and their constituent particles. Since a clock is just a pile of labels, why do we see it as so concrete? Everything, samsara and nirvana, suffering and happiness, the things we talk about from morning to night, is labeled. Everything comes from the mind, is imputed by the mind. We can understand that a clock exists in dependence upon the particular base that performs the function of giving the time and the thought that labels it clock. A clock is not independent. It doesn't exist from its own side. A clock is a dependent arising. It exists in dependence upon a base that performs the particular function of giving the time and the mind. Thus a clock is completely empty of existing from its own side. A clock does not exist from there, from the side of the clock, but from the side of the mind. In the view of the mind, the perceiver, there's a clock. When we hear clock, it means a dependent arising. A clock exists in dependence upon those two things, the appropriate base and the mind that labels it clock. When we hear clock, it means something that is merely imputed to a base by the mind. Clock itself is a dependent arising, a label, something imputed by the mind. It is the same with the I. Again, I means a dependent arising. The I exists in dependence upon the aggregates and the thought that labels them I. When you hear I, it means a dependent arising, something labeled or merely imputed by the mind. Since I is a label, it comes from the mind. Thus the I is empty of existing from its own side. It's the same with all the different sense objects forms, sounds, smells, tastes, and tangible objects. Again, they are nothing other than that which is merely imputed in dependence upon their base. That which is called form is what is labeled in dependence upon a base 
that has a color and shape and is an object of the eye sense. Independence upon that particular base, form, is merely imputed. Similarly with sound, sound is merely imputed by the mind to that particular phenomena that the ear sense is able to distinguish. Forms, sounds, smells, tastes, tangible objects, they're all merely imputed by the mind, in dependence upon becoming objects of particular senses. There is no such thing as real forms, real sounds, real smells, real tastes, or real tangible objects from their own side. They are completely empty. What exists is only that which is merely imputed by the mind, that which comes from the mind. These phenomena exist, but those other real phenomena do not. The forms, sounds, smells, tastes, and tangible objects that appear to us as having nothing to do with our mind, as real from their own side, are complete illusions or hallucinations. All of samsara and nirvana, everything that we blab about from morning to night, exists in this way. All these things are empty of existing from their own side. What exists is what came from our mind, what is merely imputed by our mind. And so sit with that point from Lama Zopa the way in which things come into being through being labeled. What impact does that have on your sense of self, your sense of other, your sense of what is needed or not needed? What are the ramifications of acknowledging the merely labeled reality of phenomena? To us, this I always appears inherently existent or real. Everything always appears inherently existent. Everything always appears 
as the object to be refuted. Even saying this I is enough to make the object to be refuted appear. We don't need to describe true existence or anything else. For most of us, when we simply say I, what appears to us and what we believe it to be is the truly existent I. The aggregate of form is not this I. The aggregate of feeling is not this I. The aggregate of recognition is not this I. The compounding aggregates are not this I. And the aggregate of consciousness is not this I. The term compounding aggregates or compositional mental factors refers to all the 51 mental factors apart from feeling and recognition. What they compound is their own result, their own continuation. For example, since today's consciousness produces tomorrow's consciousness, it compounds the result, tomorrow's consciousness. Even the whole group of the five aggregates is not the I, because it is the base to be labeled I. This makes it clear that it is not the I. The I exists nowhere on these aggregates, neither on the body, nor on the mind, nor even on the whole group of the aggregates. This is a clear way to meditate on emptiness, enabling us to understand the base and the label. However, this doesn't mean that there is no I. There is I. The reason there's I is that there are the aggregates, the association of body and mind. Simply because of that, we believe that there's I. And now dedicate. Jantu samchorim po she ma ke panam ke gyuchi ke pan yam pa me pa hi gon he gon du pelwa sho toni da warim po she ma ke panam ke gyuchi ke pan yam pa me pa hi gon he gon du pelwa sho May bodhicitta and the wisdom realizing emptiness deepen and unite within us. May we cut the root of samsara. May we develop into enlightenment. And you can relax your attention. Okay, so I hope that meditation struck a chord. And for your recommended reading for the rest of the week, um, have a look at how things exist. And look at chapter four, which starts on page 85. And this is a little bit of a meditative reflection that you could walk yourself through experientially. So I really recommend you read a paragraph or a sentence and then stop and really think your way around all the different issues that Rinpoche discusses in the text. Um, it's kind of a way to get yourself ready to meditate on emptiness by yourself. This is kind of your bridge between a guided meditation and a completely independent meditation. Do some reflection. And so chapter four. See you next time. <laughs>